Hi, y'all. Thanks for joining. We're getting started shortly. Good deal. And I think we're rolling. Wendy says, hi, long time. Hey, Wendy, thanks for being here. John, I'm a software engineer with about 10 years of experience. Let's ship some, let's, let's ship some features. Today we are working on user subscriptions. Laterally is open source. Here's the repository. We're going to start with better subscriptions, feature number 59. And if we have time, we will continue to fix this bug. Settings page v2, Claude chat. Those are the three that we'll get that we may get to. This one is going to be a stretch goal. I'm not sure we're going to get to the Claude chat. But keep in mind that a chat feature for Laterly is coming up soon. So here is Laterly.io before we dive in. You can see this in my about page or my bio. This is a website that helps people learn to code. This is what we're working on. It'll give you a step-by-step -step checklist here. And um, if you are a paid member like me, you can access the advanced checklist. Cool, yeah, so if you wanna to learn to code, check it out. Um, and this is what we're working on. So let's work on better subscriptions. So what's the issue here? The issue here is that um, the way I'm integrated with Stripe. The way that I'm integrated with Stripe, a user will pay, pay through Stripe and they have a particular Stripe email over there. And they also signed up on Laterly. When I integrated Stripe, my assumption was that the email would be the same. And that is apparently a critically broken and flawed assumption. So there are many people who have thankfully signed up for Laterly at a paid level. And thanks for signing up. They have signed up with a Stripe email that doesn't match their Laterly email. So the permission doesn't flow through and then I have to resolve it by hand, which is really painful. So to address that, we're not gonna completely address that today, but we're gonna partially address that today. The way that we're gonna partially address that today is add first name and last name to the user page. We are also going to add additional emails. So this is setting page V2 there is going to be a Stripe email. So the user can specify email. Uh, and we'll go ahead and do three emails, a primary, a backup, and a Stripe email. So the backup is like if you get locked out of your account kind of thing. So if I can confirm your first name and your last name and your Stripe email, then I feel really good about being able to go ahead and give you on your Laterly account the advanced permission. There's also a couple tweaks that I wanna do here. I wanna add an admin notes field to the user so that if I'm doing things by hand, I can make a note of it in the system as an admin. Entity called subscriptions, but it really doesn't make sense that it's an array today because there's only one kind of subscription. So I wanna add a type field. And in the future, the idea would be that you could be subscribed to various things, sort of like an a la carte feature-wise subscription instead of an across the board account subscription. All we have today is an across-the-board account subscription. So I'm going to create that as the default value. But in the future, you could have sort of the base subscription and then maybe subscribe to some additional particular feature. And then it would make sense why there's a collection of subscriptions. So I want to go ahead and make that make sense. And we also need to do some backfilling. So some users signed up to Laterly when the system was down, basically. Um, and as a result of that, a bunch of users don't have any subscription associated. They should at least have a free tier subscription associated by default. So we need to backfill that. Cool, so hopefully that gives you an outline for what we're doing today. Let's dive into the code. Kat Lafem, thank you for the likes. Imanti, thanks for the follow. Edom, thanks for the likes. Cool, let's dive in. If you're on TikTok, you can see the full screen. If you go over to YouTube, the link is in my bio. So to start with, we are going to dive into the schema. The Stripe customer ID should be changed to Stripe email. Um, so Stripe, looking at the transaction, like you're gonna have to trust me on this because I'm not gonna show you the transactions. <laughs> uh, the transaction object that I get, it doesn't actually tell me a Stripe user ID. It just tells me a transaction ID and their email. 
So I'm going to control P, schema. So here we are. We have the user. We have the email. Then I would like to have um, email backup and email stripe. Okay. So this will be an optional string. Or I can make it required and default it to an empty string. I like that because I only have to deal with one type if I do that. Okay. Then there's their backup email. We will do um, name. So here's the name. We're going to change this to um, first name, last name. I, I do this Hungarian style, name first, name last. And again, we'll go with the default backup strings here. The default empty string. Okay, so I have your first and your last name. That makes sense to me. I would like this to be called email primary. I can leave it alone. I'm going to leave it alone. This is their this is their primary email. Um, yeah, that would require a level of refactoring the code that's just not worth it to me right now. So they have a primary backup and Stripe email. Let's confirm that the Stripe customer ID is gone from all objects. It's not, it's right here. So the user still has a Stripe customer ID. So I'm going to remove that. The database migration might complain to me about the fact that I just straight up removed it right there. I don't like the name of this property. Subscription changes is on the subscription. So I'm, I'm camel casing that, Q-R-S-T-U. Okay, I think it works. This seems to be working. User should gain admin notes. Let's add that, defaulted to an empty string. Bye, I love you. Love you, bye. And I'm doing this like weird sort of quasi alphabetical thing, which is super annoying. This section is the uh, like related entities. This section is supposed to be the boilerplate and this section is supposed to be the non boilerplate primitives, but it's all goofed up. So I don't really like that. Um, ID is a boilerplate. Let's move that. Created at is a boilerplate. Why is there no updated at? Oh, there, here's the updated at. That's a boilerplate. Okay. Cool. Um, email is really not a boilerplate. That's a special thing for users, isn't it? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N. Cool. So I think that's a little better. I think that's a little more organized. And you can see they're alphabetically sorted within their block, which is totally not necessary. It's just an opinion. Doesn't matter. Um, okay. This is a common annoyance that I have with my current version of Prisma. Let me make a note. I have an optional item to upgrade Prisma. I don't know if this will fix it. Upsert in seed script and Prisma 5. Let me edit this. Feel free to split into two tickets if needed. 
Um, would Prisma 5 let me do the unique except when null operation? I could use that for um, backup email and strike email user fields. So I have this low priority issue to upgrade Prisma because I don't have like a real need to upgrade Prisma. But if it lets me do this, that could be a clincher where I'm like, oh, I need to actually do that. So I should look into that more. John Kruger, people will literally do anything to avoid writing SQL. You are right. You are so right. Bafana, is there format? Is there formatter for Prisma files? Yes, there is. Uh, so I have it configured to run on save. Um, let me show you my settings file. Here is my workspace settings. Mm, nope, not there. Let me look in my user settings. Prisma is also not here. OK, so it's not using either of them. It's just using the extension. So there is a Prisma extension uh, right here. And you can see um, add syntax highlighting, linting, code completion, formatting, jump to definition. Basically, if you work with Prisma, you should definitely get this thing. <laughs> Love your content, by the way. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Over 1,000 likes already and over 40 people on the TikTok. Awesome to see y'all. Quick reminder, you can go over to YouTube and see the full screen. All right, cool. So um, this is looking good. So what do I want to do now? Let's make sure that I have the fields. Did I lose a page? I have three issues I'm working on. Two, three, and then the fourth, which I'm stretching for. One, two, three. OK, so this is unnecessary. We close that. So let's audit the fields. I have customer ID is done. Admin notes is done. Subscription change should get strike transaction ID. That's right. So currently, when you change your, like, currently you as a user cannot go change your subscription. You can't do it. Um, what you do is you make a payment to Stripe, and then Stripe emails me, literally emails me. Um, and then I have to, by hand, go into the system and update the database. That's the state of the system today. Um, obviously, that's not scalable, but I only have uh, a, a, around 100 users at the moment, so it's not a big deal. Um, in the future, the Stripe transaction ID needs to get append, like, this, I should be able to record this in the subscription change. Whenever I change it, subscription ID. Whenever I change it, I want to be able to refer to the strike thing that like proves that it's true. <laughs> Does that make sense? OK, cool. What language are you coding in? So this is, so the project is in TypeScript. What we're looking at right now is a DSL, a domain-specific language. That's the Prisma DSL, which is a database modeling language. Um, OK. And if you wanted to learn this, just chat with ChatGPT. It understands it quite well. Stripe transaction ID. I think I can just add this. I'm just trying to think a little bit slower. Why would I not just drop this as a string right here? And I have no good answer. I think that's exactly what I should do. So the Stripe transaction ID is a string. And I don't really want it to be optional. I'm trying to think through, is there a case where you would be able to change your subscription without a Stripe transaction? Oh, if you down tier. So if you. Um, go from a high level tier to the free tier if you cancel, basically. I don't know that there's a Stripe transaction for that. So I will allow it to be optional for now. What language is this? This is a Prisma domain specific language. The GitLens info in pain by terminal show. My GitLens stuff, my GitLens stuff is all in line. Yeah, I just use it in line. I don't know. Let's see. Get lens. I don't ever come over here.
we could do a feature walkthrough if you want to. I'd rather not. I'd rather code some stuff. It looks like um, it's a tree visualizer. Yeah, it looks like it's going to have a, a cool visual commit graph. But I think you have to sign in for that. I don't know if that comes in the free version or not. Do you code in Java? Not usually. Shallow House says, I meant down at bottom in the info window. Uh, oh, okay. Let's see. Visual file history. So it's just another um, file history visualizer. I mean, that's kind of cool. Is it always the current file? Yeah. Wow. I actually never... No this is awesome. <laughs> this is super helpful. I never noticed this. So... Um, yeah, whatever current file you have active, it pops the git history in here visually. Thanks for showing. Thanks for asking. I legit <laughs> I legit didn't know that was there. <laughs> um, I don't know if it works with GitHub Enterprise because I think at work, when I clicked this, I just got an error, if I recall correctly. So maybe just because my repo is open source, it works. All right, let's get back to the code. Over 50 people on TikTok. Thanks for being here. If you go over to YouTube, you can see the full screen. Now we have the Stripe transaction ID. We need to backfill all users. So that will be a separate commit. Subscriptions should have a type defaulted to account plan. Okay, we can do that now as well. Subscriptions have a type which is a string. In theory, this could be an enum. Um, like, hold on, let's not put a to do if I don't have a concrete use case. Um, nothing bugs me more than unfulfillable to do's. So the default will be account plan. Good. Moon says, can I ask you a question? Of course, ask away, bro. Thanks for being here. So now I will npm run migrate. That's going to back up my users and then perform a database migration. <laughs> I always back up my users. You only, you only drop your user table a few times before you know that you should never call migrate Enter a name for migration. So this is um, does a number of things. The main thing it does is it updates the user. Um, more email fields and subscript and sub subtype subscription type. More email fields and subscription type. It's a pretty good name. Mikhail, I'm making something with requests and REST API first time. Best algo to exec Rex without a timeout? Question mark. Google Sheets and Drive API. So that was not a super well-worded question, Mikhail. So you're asking for the best algorithm to execute requests without a request timeout. I don't know. I think you should always have a request timeout. Um, yeah, I think I need you to reword the question because what I would say is you should always have a request timeout. You should always define some time at which you force fail your connection. Otherwise, you can have an infinitely hanging request and that's a world of pain. Moon says, when I meet other people who code, I notice they have similar personality types Makes me feel like I don't belong, bro. Uh, don't be like that. Don't be like that. Um, programming is so diverse, man. Uh, there is there is a average personality, but there's a lot of diversity. And pick another industry that doesn't have that. You know, um, industries have norms. But let me show you something. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of programming. That's what I want to show you. So when you think about the different kinds of programmers, I think Stack Overflow uh, did this one year. Gender um, and programming role. 
I might have to go back to my blog. I think I blogged this. Stack Overflow Developer Survey, 2020 maybe. And basically, um, like database admins and web developers who work on the front end with a lot of visual design and middle layer developers, there's all these different sorts of developers and data analysts and they vary significantly by race and gender, which is, which is an indirect proxy that's correlated to things like values and personality. And so if you're feeling like you don't fit in, maybe you should just look at a different role, is my point. And there's also different uh, personality in the sense of different um, orientations. So there's something called the RISEC scale, R-A-I-S-E-C. People orientation and things orientation, artistic, social, enterprising. So this is a personality scale, basically. Um, and like different personalities are going to focus on different parts of the technology stack. So if you are not vibing with the coders you know, maybe you should hang out with some different coders because there's a lot of different kinds of coding is what I'm saying. Moon says, I'm from the hood, bro. That's OK. There's some, there's some people that come out the hood and code, man. It's rare. It's rare, but it happens. And why don't you step up and do it? Because the more people that do it, the more role models there are for the next time around. You feel me? Katoomba, is this a new chat GPT interface? Uh, no. Will a meta course get you a job? Uh, the best... Courses from Coursera in partnership with Meta have a job placement rate of around 25%. So the answer is they can, but I wouldn't bank on it. Sefer, is university good for coding or is it better to start learning at home? What do you mean better? That word better is so tricky. It's a good idea to start learning whenever you have time, whether that's at university or not. Um... I can't answer the term better because it depends on your personal situation. It's not like college is universally better or worse. It's like there are some situations where college is better or worse. How often do you use ChatGPT? Um, probably four days a week. All right. Uh, and Undone Coffee. You can middle click on things to open them in a new tab instead of going through the options. Yeah, that's... Um, you can also middle click on tabs to close them. Uh, that's not working for me right now. Um, so I think you need to like have a certain mouse or have your stuff set up a certain way to do that. That would be cool, but that doesn't work on my mouse for whatever reason. Okay, so we didn't really get to the, to the gender graph. Um, dang. Can I see here, community? Uh, I'll give this three more minutes. I'm gonna time box it and then we'll move on. Developer profiles, demographics. So here is race and ethnicity. I'm looking for a square grid, not a bar chart. Okay. Yes, this is what I was looking for. Okay, so it's in the 2020 Stack Overflow Developer Survey. I don't know how, I literally don't know how I remember that. I think because it just stuck out to me, like it was striking data. Um, so DevOps and sysadmins are more than 25 ratio male to female. Okay. And the way this works is you can kind of draw a correlation between how close they are to the UI versus how far they are from the UI. So DevOps and sysadmins are the most backend of the backend, right? Um, then database admin is kind of in the middle of the backend. Um, here's site reliability. You can see this is like very um, things oriented and isolated from end users. So again, think with the RISEC scale model. This is very things oriented and isolated from an end user. On the back end, as you move towards the front end, so um, developer game or graphics is closer to an end user than a DevOps specialist. We're moving towards the end user. Product managers are even closer towards the end user. A mobile developer, we're actually getting into something that's literally client facing now. Arguably the game like graphics developers, arguably client facing developers. Literally you have people 
you're coding the UI. Um, and now the ratio is only 15 times male to female. Okay, so it's still over, overwhelmingly male, but you can see the trend. Now we go full stack, which is more female. Uh, and now we go front end. Front end is way more female. Business analyst is, is more female. I don't know that that cops with the trend necessarily. Um, but designer, designer um, is even more female than front end. And if you know about design work, yes, it's artistic, but and maybe that plays a role. Actually, it probably does play a role, the artistic side of it. But front-end development is quite artistic, let me assure you. Designers, however, typically interact with end users more. So design research involves literal, literal like end user research. And um, at, some, at many companies, you will do user studies and have like small groups and literally talk to humans. Um, so they're interacting with end users like even more than front-end developers. Okay, now this is just gender uh, in this graph, but hopefully I've persuaded you that this is correlated to personality. And we know from psychology literature that gender correlates with personality anyway. On average, this is not for like all men or all women. It's nothing like that. This is just an average finding. Uh, women are more people-oriented. Men are more things-oriented. But what I want to convince you here is that there is still a huge personality range within programming and within. And this is only one dimension, but I'm, I'm going to assert, and then I guess I don't really have data for it or it'd take me a long time to look it up. I'm gonna assert that if you arrange the job roles of programmers in different ways, you will find diversity along other spectrums besides this people things spectrum. You'll find other spectrums where different roles are emphasizing different things and they work with different personality types. And the big, the big thing that I would ask you to consider, here's the big three I'll ask you to consider. Front end, back end, data science. That's it. Front end, back end, data science. If you've been trying uh, like back end programming, the mindset is very, very different from front end pro programming. And the mindset of either of these people is different from true data science. It's a very different mindset. Okay, so that ends my rant. Thanks for being here. Um, why Rand says, what are your thoughts on data science? I think it's great. Um, I think it's harder to break into, but it's great. Idomar, what is your title? Uh, my working type, my title at work is senior software engineer. Cool. Um, let's get back to some code, right? What we came here to do. So here, this migration failed. Oh no, why is it logging emails, bro? Now I'm gonna have to go back and scrub this stream. That sucks. How did it end up logging an email? Invalid upsert in restore users, okay? Right, right. So the um, this restore is invalid because I just changed the UI type so that the uh, it does a backup and a migration and a restore. So the backup user shape, the key value relations under an object, that's different than what I'm trying to restore now that the database has been upgraded. So actually, this is kind of a good sign. It indicates that the yeah, it integrate it indicates that the migration itself succeeded. And now I just need to update my um, restore script, basically. I'm going to take this database off screen. OK, so I have my database off screen. And I'm looking at the user table. I'm going to suspect that um, users were not actually harmed. And I have the same record count. I just happened to know before I started the stream, I looked at my count of users. So I have the same user record count. Um, is there email backup, email stripe, name, first name, last name? Did we drop the name column is what I was worried about might fail. It worked. 
I, it dropped the name column successfully, I think because it was empty in every case. So that's why it was able to drop it. Okay, so the user table looks good. So I don't actually need to run the restore user script. However, I'm gonna fix it just for, for code. Excuse me, I was gonna fix it just for code correctness so that next time around it works. But for the current situation, it actually, it actually doesn't matter too much. Okay, um, so let's just throw this into chat GPT and ask it to fix it. So we'll do a new chat, code interpreter, role, we are both expert programmers developing an application in a blitz.js stack context. We have, or I, I'll say I have, recently updated the Prisma schema, including the user model, breaking a utility script. Task. Um, update the restore user.js to comply with the new type. Uh, the new user model. Okay, so I'm going to grab this and I'll say ask clarifying questions if needed before writing the new script. It's Amar says we, yes, we. Um, so the purpose of rolling we is that it will basically speak to me more efficiently. Um, so if it thinks that it's an expert, but it thinks that I'm an average human, it's going to take the long way around to say things, um, which is expensive from a token perspective. And often it can lead to the use of metaphor or analogy and ineff otherwise inefficient communication. So it is a good idea to roll not only the chat agent, but also the me, me is the person speaking with the chat agent. What is your stack? Blitz.js. Lily, is there a free GPT version we can do this with? Uh, I recommend you use Claude. Claude 2. Um, you can use chat GPT 3.5. You can use it. It's just not good. I really don't recommend it. And on second thought, I don't recommend Claude for technical questions either. It's really good for non-technical questions. <laughs> so here's my YouTube video. I released this just a couple days ago, Claude versus GPT-4. Feel free to try the 3.5 model, which is free. I, I just don't find it to be very helpful. But if you are more of a junior, you might find it helpful. There is research that indicates that juniors disproportionately benefit from G, chat GPT assistance. I'm pretty senior. I find uh, I find that um, it, it just doesn't help me because the, the questions that I would even bother to ask are, are more com on the complex side. Role context. I have recently updated the Prisma schema, including the user model, breaking a utility script. Here's the new schema. Uh, here's a fragment. Here's the new user model uh, schema fragment. Okay, so that's the script. Here's the um, broken legacy script. Um, Maybe I should just blitz prisma generate. Local geek says, hi brother. What's up local geek? Thanks for being here. 
Thanks for all the likes. Thank you, Lily. We're over 2,500 likes. I'm just going to try running the script again on the off chance that this was... Uh, a peer type issue. So backup users, backup users, users restored. So npm run users. Um, let me let me let me back it up one time. I need to also update the backup script. Users restore. Okay, that worked fine. I'm going to take this off screen and look at my ba local backup JSON. Back dot users. It there are the email backup email stripe. So all the new fields are there. So all the new fields are there. Yeah. Uh, I think it's because I was trying to insert the name field and I had dropped the name field. Okay, it makes sense. I think we're good to continue. Note to self, I need to scrub the stream. If y'all want to pop a clip, go ahead, just so that I can remember to scrub the uh this one poor user, I think there's one poor user and I exposed his email. So, sorry, sorry person. <laughs> Shifer, yes, 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 ice cream, so good. Shifer, pop a, crit, uh, a clip, homie. Um, yeah, what was that viral video? I, I'm not about to do the invitation, yo. If you wanna join, you can do it. <laughs> pop, pop, pop. Which library do you use to debug? I'm thinking about learning Jest. Why do you need a library to debug? There's a, a, break, a debugger keyword is built into Node. And you have uh, console.log. Uh, you have dev tools. So, I mean, yeah, feel free to learn Jest, but using Jest for a debugger is kind of strange to me. There is the, um, the Chrome extension for React. I don't really use it, but back in the day, it was helpful. If you use Redux, um, that can be helpful. Yeah, because it does let you do time travel with Redux, the React developer tools for Chrome. Okay, so I think we're good. Um, we have the schema, we have the migration, we ran it on prod, prod is already up to date. So then I better check it in, <laughs> otherwise we'll, have, uh, we'll be missing our code. So this is feature, and what is the feature here? Um, Pretty much the same as the name I gave the migration. More email fields and subscription type. Let me also check the subscriptions in the database. Have they been backfilled? No, we're gonna need to, okay. Um, we're gonna need to do the backfill script next. Okay, cool. This is a technique that like you don't see a lot of the time in open source work. Cause it's not sexy, it's super boring but we are going to do a backfilling script. So what is a backfilling script? A backfilling script is often used to resolve bugs. Um, if you have like a database outage, then you may have missing records. Um, in many cases, you can fix those missing records with a backfilling script and such is the case today. So some users tried to sign up for laterally when the database was down and as a result, they don't have a subscription object. Um, when the system is expecting every user to have at least one subscription object, uh, including, including the free tier, but these users just don't have one at all, um, which I think means they may not even be able to view the free checklist, which is kind of a bummer, right? What is this close? This is going to close uh, number 59. Samuel, thanks for sharing. We use the closest tag because it will automatically resolve the issue when the PR gets merged. The build field, huh? That makes sense. Let's go ahead and fix it. Um, I altered the schema, so there's probably a broken form somewhere. Object literal may only specify, oh, and I'll put a note here. Uh, 
Scrubs, how, how far into the stream are we in? 40 minutes, great. So I only have to review 40 minutes to scrub. Scrub stream uh, two times, I think it was two times, maybe three times, two to three X prior to 40 min mark. Okay. Um, control shift F, control V, enter. There's another way to troubleshoot uh, item R is helps you troubleshoot. People like to crap on types, like they like to say that it's not helpful, but look, it prevented me from shipping a bug to prod just now, right? And it does this like every day, like every, like almost every day, my build system prevents a bug. So um, I don't get the complaints. So the issue here is that it says name when name doesn't exist anymore. So we should say name first, name last. Do I want to ship anything else for the user? So name first does not exist on user select. Well, it should. Let me control click into the user type. Name first, name last. So they exist. OK, I just had to bust the VS code cache on the type. I'm trying to think through the cases where I use this. Um, this is the signup hook. So signup is creating the user. It doesn't need to know name at all. I try to minimize the properties that I pass at signup time because the more properties that you require at signup time, you're reducing your user signup conversion rate because people don't want to fill out long forms. So instead of changing name to first name and last name, I just nuked the name field, which wasn't being passed anyway. I think I was passing an empty string in every case. Um, now on the settings page, I want to enable people to, to mention their first name and last name, which is going to be a good thing because eventually we're going to have public profiles and on your profile you'd like to say, hey, my name is John Vandeveer and I'm certified, right? But I don't want to require that at sign up time. Over 3,000 likes, y'all right. Y'all rock. Sorry about that. Michael says, what are you coding? The answer is latterly.io. The link is in my bio. If you're on YouTube, it's going to be under the about page. Ooh, username. Oh, dang, I broke prod. Rookie mistake. Rookie mistake. OK, so let's try to blitz Prisma build or NPM run build. Prod is down. Prod is down. Maybe this will fix it. Maybe this change alone will fix it. I'm not sure. So we'll go ahead and prepare the commit. This is fix. Um, sign up name field. This is because my local computer is connected con directly to the prod DB. <laughs> That's why this is a problem. Uh, if I had a staging database, this would not be an issue. Subscriptions does not exist on type user, doesn't it though? Ah, here's another user issue. So this is the case where I'm getting the current user. And here I would like to know the name. So name first, name last. And I'd like to know the other emails here as well, uh, because this get current user is going to, it's going to power the settings page. So th this data will show up on the settings page. Email, Stripe. True. Email backup is true. 
and let's put that back into alphabetical order. And admin notes I don't want to expose here. Is there anything else on the schema change? Control P, Prisma Schema. Is there anything else here that I would like to expose to the user? No, I think that's it. I think that's it. OK. Let's try to run the build. I'm going to go ahead and look for user.name. This is the Wellevent project. That's a different project. That's fine. You can generify it even further and just look for dot name. Maybe lowercase u on user. <sighs> Here's a checklist name, a plan name. and an error name. Okay, so I'm seeing no instances of usernames. So I think we're good now. The build will confirm, but I think we are good. Um, so this is fixing the name signup field. This is more, now it's more than that. Now it is uh, name queries, fixed name queries. We passed the, um, basic linting and validity of type checks. So I'm going to go ahead and commit this. That's basically a really green flag that we're going to get the, all the way through the build. Although never say never until it's done. But the fact that we passed type validity and types were the issue is like a pretty strong flag that we are on the right path here. <laughs> Files changed since revision. OK, what? So it's saying that this file changed, but I'm not seeing any differences. It might just be a line ending. So on Windows, this happens sometimes. It's like build system is using Linux code. Um, it could manipulate the line endings, basically. So I'm looking at this diff, and it looks the way I expect. So that's fine. I'll do this on the command line now that the command line's freed up. So the uh, static generation passed, by the way. Cool. So we'll push that. This will actually not close um, 59 as is it will partially resolve 59. But all I need to do is the backfill script. So let me go ahead and write that, and that will let us close out the whole issue. OK, so what do I want to tell chat GPT? What I would like to ask ChatGPT is to make a backfill script that will create a subscription for each user if the subscription doesn't exist. Okay, so roles, we are both experts, um, JavaScript and TypeScript programmers working with a blitz.js stack including Prisma, ORM, context, here's the Prisma schema. Task, just say ACK for now. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and dump the whole schema into its memory. This is not necessary. I just don't want to go like pull out the relevant pieces. So I'm going to grab the whole thing. Um, although I am pretty sure that like the tail end quiz results, curriculum unit quiz, quiz item, possible answer. So these things don't matter. 
transaction. Oh, there's the Stripe payment ID. So maybe I haven't been using the transaction. Yeah, I think that's one of the things I've been doing wrong. That's okay. We can have some duplicate data for now and we can fix it later. So I can only fit so much stuff in a single request to the GPT UI, and that's why I did it this way, just say act for now. And now I'll say um, task create a backfill or utility script called ensure user subscriptions.js. This script should loop through um, all existing uh, or like all database users if any user has zero subscriptions associated to them it should create a new subscription for them with a tier value of free. Um, please, or, or like, ask click as needed before writing any code. So here's the task, ask clarifying questions before, and should I provide a reference as well? Um, context, Here's an example of another utility script in our code base. This is called restoreuser.js. restoreusers.js. And actually, I don't need to say that. I can tag it like this, restoreusers.js. Now, why am I providing an example script? This is called multi-shot prompting, and it's shown to improve results. I'm giving the system an example of something like what I would want it to do. That just helps the system understand the general template that I would like it to work in. Itamar says, I have never heard about your stack. I'm a junior MERN full stack. Cool. Well, glad, you, uh, glad you've heard about it now. Quick reminder, you can go to YouTube and see the full screen. We are creating a subscription only if there are new, no subscription user, correct? If a user has even one subscription, we will not create Okay, that's right. That is correct. When creating the new subscription, aside from the tier being set to free, what values should we set for the other fields in the subscription model are there any default values or specific values you'd like us to use for these fields? The answer is you should use the Prisma defaults, which are already specified, right? Subscription. Subscription. Um, you should be able to tell the user ID. Subscription changes. Um, Leave subscription changes empty. Mm. 
use the default, use the correct value for values uh, like um, user ID value for the given user and use the default subscription type. Let me know if there are particular fields that you are still confused about. Use current time for the created app and do not create any subscription change records. Do we need to handle any specific error cases? For example, what should we do if database connection fails? Um, the answer simply log the failure with a readable message and exit. Feel free to include any useful metadata in the log as well. Itamar says, going YouTube, awesome. Nate, is it worth going to college for computer programming? In general, yes, although there's specific cases where it may not make sense. But in general, it is a, a good idea for someone uh, uh, who has a high likelihood of passing. So if you're someone who you're worried about failing out of the program, uh, maybe you're not very good at math or something like that. If you're worried that you're going to fail out of the program, think twice about even starting it. Maybe you should just go for a business degree. But if you're the sort of person who's like, dude, I could totally pass the program. I just don't know if it's worth the money. Uh, in that case, the answer is usually it is worth the money. So again, there's particular cases where it may not make sense. And I do one-on-one -on -one consultations. Um, let me fix my website so you can book a consultation with me. Oh, did I fix the website already? Man, I'm cool for that. Nope, it's still failing. So this is passing now. I could merge it, but I wanna get that backfill script going and then I'll get the website up for you. And if you'd like to have a personalized consultation, you will be able to sign up for that soon. Thanks for the clarification given these requirements here at Thang is. Cool. Looks good to me. So here I'm going to close others and create a new script. Actually, here I'd like to create a new folder. And this will be called, um, so this is backfills. Or, or sort of like uh, one-off, one-offs. One-off scripts and backfill scripts are, um, usually they substantially overlap. Are they exactly the same thing? Uh, no, they're not, because you can have some one-off scripts that are not backfills. The idea of a backfill is that you have existing rows with data that needs to be updated. Um, so this is a very common case of a one-off script, but you can actually have one-off scripts that don't backfill, they, they forward fill or create new data. So good, I'm glad I named the folder one-off because that is the super category and backfill would be the subcategory. But the truth is that they substantially overlap. This will be called, um, Ensure subs uh, user subscriptions.js. I call this a one off, but in theory, I might run it again. Whatever. Hopefully, I don't have to. Since we dropped this a folder deeper than our other utilities, I need to increase the traversal up the path to grab the dot env file. This code looks good to me. It's simple, right? Include the subscriptions if the length is zero. Make sure that they have this, at, le at, le at least this one. Bro, I am glitching today. Someone give me some caffeine. Nate says, okay, awesome, thanks. Hey, glad you're here. 
Mike Jones joined. What up, Mike Jones? Who? Mike Jones. So now I am going to node. I'm going to run it from node. Scripts, one-offs, ensure. Cool. So we backfilled a bunch of users that tried to sign up when the system was down. Let me look in the database now. Obviously, this is not on screen. And now I see a bunch of subscriptions. Great. This is going to allow me to enable a premium account because somebody paid me money through Stripe and they didn't have a subscription that I could uh, increase the tier on. So I'll, I will fix that while this thing uh, runs through Git. So here, this is feet um, backfill subscriptions. Cool, and now you're aware of this sort of like boring backfill pattern that is really quite common in the commercial world but you don't see people doing this in their hobby projects because people don't have large hobby projects with a bunch of users that they would ever need to backfill. Um, hobby users are often like wiping the whole database to fix their issues and stuff like that. So hopefully that was informative for you. We push the commit, here it is. It's gonna build shortly, I expect it to pass. In the meantime, let me go fix this one user Bam, and now they can access the advanced checklist. We love to see it. Well, as soon as I merge this PR and prod is fixed because <laughs> it's still down on the code that's expecting the name property to exist on users, even though I migrated the database to remove the name property. It was, a, it, was a, it was an amateur move, I'll own it. I ran a destructive migration on prod from my local, but we're in alpha, Laterally is an alpha. You're not a real project yet, unless you have 100 commits. Have y'all heard this rule of thumb? Laterally has not hit 100, uh, the new version, Laterally version three, hasn't hit 100 commits, so we really, really alpha out here. And I don't mean alpha like the gym bros mean alpha. <laughs> I mean alpha like programmers mean alpha, which is like not a huge compliment. Bam, we shipped some code. We closed an issue. Another one bites the dust. You see GitHub automatically closed and referenced the um, number 67 which is what we just hit the merge button on, okay? Good, um, this is good. So let me close this. What about these other issues? What should we do next? We're not gonna be able to get to Claude chat. I just realized it depends on 49 and, we haven't, and we're not gonna be able to fall, solve 49 today. Um, okay, so these other two are what we're working on. Cool, and now prod, it, oh no. It's okay, it's gonna take a minute for the build to show environments. Let's check in Vercel. This is the like staging environment for Vercel. Let me actually look in like the real Vercel. Okay, so it says it's in production now. So um, let me do a hard cache, empty cache and hard reload. This one should stay up, right? On the network tab, I'm seeing green lights. Can I see the standard checklist? Yep. Cool, 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 we love to see it. Can I see the advanced checklist? Yep. Okay, so everything's working. So now, if you are the dude who sent me $5 yesterday, <laughs> um, you can go access the advanced checklist now. Yay, a win is a win, right? A win is a win. Uh, by the way, if you are not that person, you can also go sign up for free to access the standard checklist and as little as a dollar a month. 
to access the advanced checklist and for a limited time only, a one-on-one -on -one call with me. That's a shout out to Nate over there who is asking about um, college. So I can do a one-on-one -on -one consultation for you if you would like. Okay, next issue is settings page V2 for the user checklist items. These are both really important. I should just not waste time picking them. I should just do them both today. So we'll start with this. So it allows you to create a public profile. You don't alter the subscription level. Text tells user to email admin to cancel subscription. This is already done. Uh, today, if you go to the settings page, please email me to update your subscription tier. Uh, we'll automate it in the future, but that's how it is today. Ability to update name and email. Yes, let's do that now. So I'm going to git checkout main. I'm gonna git pull. Now I'm gonna create this new feature branch. The GitHub issue number is 53, so we'll say git branch 53, enable update email and name. Okay, uh, let's check it out. I could have done checkout dash B, but whatever. Git branch to confirm that I have switched. Here I am. Now I'm going to control P and I hit the O button because I'm silly. Uh, silly, goofy mood like that. Control P, settings, uh, index, and I'm fuzzy typing it as you can see. Here we are. So this is the current settings page and it needs to be better. It needs to be better. So a user has get settings, like they have a collection of settings. Um, like why did I, why did I do that? I did that. I have no clue. I have no clue why I did that. Shouldn't they only have one setting, uh, user setting object? Laterally schema. Let me go review the schema. Maybe it'll jog my memory. Setting uh, user I don't see settings at all, do you? Settings. Okay, so maybe this is a pseudo type. Update setting schema, get settings. Okay, so it's really getting your, like your subscription settings. It's really getting your subscription settings. Um, like, I'm not mad at this. I don't want users to do this right now. So what do I want a user to see here? I want them to see their first name, their last name, and their emails. I'm not, I'm not bothered if they see their subscription level. It would actually be nice to show them their subscription level. They just can't update it here. Cool. Um, so we should join this with the, with the get current user. So here's the user ID. Here's the context session user. We want to, this, okay, chat GPT, let's update this get settings query to include um, um, user data. The settings object should, uh, the, the synthetically calculated settings object should include user name first, name last, all of the it, all of the email fields. Pretty much that's it. 
and all of the email fields. And all of the email fields in addition to, to the currently returned subscription. Good deal. Itamar, do you think TS is critical that must to learn? Grin, Grin Ninja, felt like making you have another viewer. Thanks, Grin Ninja. Thanks for being here. Um, what does critical mean? Uh, I think it's a very high return on investment. I, I would not say that it's critical. And what, and what critical means to me is... If you don't have it, you will not get a job. That's what would make it critical in my book. And that is not the case. You can totally get a job without knowing TypeScript. It's just significantly harder. That's how I would think through the problem. Does that make sense? Thanks for the question. Okay, so I'm going to copy this code. I want to provide a settings type. Const get settings equals z dot object. Z dot object. Um, can you improve the type? <sighs> name first, name last, email. Good. We love to see it. Ask and you shall receive. I don't know that I care to have subscription changes. Let me look here. So here I was including subscription changes. Ah, this is going to create it just in time. Got it. Where's my sign up thing? Uh, sign up. Here's the sign up mutation. So I should have the. L let me let me copy this code so that I don't lose it. But what it's doing is it's creating the subscription here. And I don't want that. I want to create the subscription when they sign up. Um, update this sign up hook or sign up uh, logic so that a so that a user is assigned a new free tier subscription by default at sign up time ba da 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 ba da 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 Shout out to Liquid Death, Grim Reefer, Grim Leafer, Grim Leafer. If y'all are sponsoring, I'm open. We need to make a database call to create a new subscription right after the user is created. Here is how the updated signup logic would work. Create the user, create the subscription and create the session. Looks good to me. Looks good to me. This will help me not need to backfill in the future. Although I might need to do it one more time if a bunch of y'all signed up while I was streaming today. Let's import this from DB, looks good, okay. I'm going to stage this by itself, git commit dash m feet uh, user sub create free sub at sign up. 
I'm surprised I wasn't already doing that. I thought I was already doing that. Moon says, what is a widely used IDE that the average software engineer does everything on? What I'm using right now, VS Code. VS Code, that's the answer. Good question. Control click activates my browser. So here's create free sub. I'm going to cut that out and drop it here. And we'll do a list of things it does. Closes. Closes better subscriptions. Isn't that one already closed though? Okay, yeah, so that's not what we're doing. Is it 11? Maybe it's 11, let's go see. It's 53, that's what it is. Closes 53. Um, create free subscription at sign up time. Uh, user can update, can see their subscription. Uh, level, name, and emails on settings page. User can update name and email on settings page. Is there anything else to do under 53? Allows you to create a public profile. We're going to do that. Uh, we're going to do that separately. Dang, no, we should do it now. allows you to create a public profile. It's just gonna say your name is all it's gonna say right now. I'll, I'll, I'll try to list standard checklist progress. Uh, user can enable a public profile that shows first name, last name, and standard checklist progress. I wanna do that in a separate PR. And so I'm going to break up the issue because I want to get the free subscription at sign up time. I want to get that shipped to prod. Okay, so here I am. I'm going to create a new issue, open link in new tab, allow user to create a public profile. Let's edit and strike that. Uh, I'll just delete it. I don't know. I, where's the strike thing? Setting page V2. Settings page V2.5, because <laughs> I already have a V3. I already have a V3, so we'll call this 2.5. So I took this feature requirement out and moved it to its own user story. Does that make sense? Moon says, I think before I dig into programming, I need to better understand file management. Yeah, maybe if you want to, whatever you want to do. Okay, so this is looking better. This is looking better. And I still want this to be a, um, you know what, it's not even that high of a priority. So I'll leave it alone. Settings page V2, this one is still high priority. Claude chat, cool. Uh, this, yeah, here it is. Okay. Um, that's it. So now this is going to be correct. So this will be settings like um, better settings page. Cool. Create that pull request. And now what I want to do, user can see their subscription name, level name and emails on settings page. Did I already get that code? This is the, um, the get settings data, and it's creating the subscription if it doesn't exist. So let's, let's get some simpler code now. Now that subscriptions are created at sign up time, there is no reason to create one at, um, get settings time 
update that query script appropriately. So this is going to simplify. Do you see how they're related? This is going to simplify this logic. There's a bunch of lines over here. You see this if? I don't need this if block at all. I don't need that at all. So that's what we're doing right now. If you're liking the video, give it a tap, give it a like. The algorithm will share it out. I appreciate it. Cool. So now if it's not there, we just throw an error. I think that's fine. That's good. Get settings. What is this? Um, is helping us should we remove it oh okay it's validating that we didn't pass anything Okay. All right. Now we go to get settings query. Here it is. Right click, close others, control A. And look at that. Now we're under, we're at 55 lines. What, what, what was it before? It was over 80. So it's a lot simpler. It's more maintainable, easier to read. We love to see it. Let's import the subscription for the DB. Okay. And now Thanks, Adam. Thanks for the likes. Now we go back over here to this page right here. And we're going to show setting data. Okay, this says fix number 53. That's what we're working on right now. So I could have like a display section and then an update section. Uh, but I guess the layout of this page is kind of doing it, doing both at once. Just pro provide the initial values into the setting form and that way the user will be able to see it. Let's look for some update mutation. Oh, here's an update setting mutation. But you're not able to update your tiers here. Um, okay. Now let's create update settings Update settings mutation. Update setting mutation. As a complement to the um, query logic written. Uh, the user is not able to update their subscription at all, but they can update their name and email fields with this mutation. Okay, name first, name last, email. This is looking good. Now the main email is not optional. The main email is not optional. So let's make sure that we watch the logic. Is it going to try to write an empty string to the database 
or will it fall back to their original email somehow? What happens if the user attempts to an imp, an imp value? Will the uh, user record be updated to hold an empty email? Or will the database reflect their email as it was before updating? Before, before uh, running this mutation. The email field is defined as optional so it can be omitted from the input. However, it's optional and not nullable in the Prisma model. So if you attempt to submit an empty string, it would be considered a valid value and the user's email would be updated to the empty string. If you want to prevent this behavior, you should add additional validation to reject empty strings. Here is how you can modify the update setting Zod schema to reject empty strings. They just put min one. Why would it be optional then? Doesn't that make it, doesn't that get effectively required? Uh, doesn't that make email effectively required? The email field should be validated. The other fields can be set to empty. Good. All right, now we actually have a good Zod schema. <sighs> this is the update settings schema. So here's the whole logic. Let me copy this. Update settings mutation TS. Control A, V, S. Notice how we didn't just do like the first thing it suggested, right? You need to work with this bad boy. It helps us. It saves time. Uh, but don't just don't just take what it says at face value. Um, user ID. This value could be null. This user ID may be, yeah, like whatever. I can just, this is where it's not worth it to even ask it. So here, um, if the user ID should never be zero, but I'll technically compare it to null.
So if the user ID is null, they have an invalid session. Is there a session error? No. If they have an invalid session, I'm going to consider that to be an authorization error. Good, and now the type error has gone away. Hunky Dory, Hunky Dory. <sighs> Update setting schema. So I think that is just uh, this. Let's call it update settings schema. This is the validator that we are going to use on the form of setting schema. So let's uncomment that, drop it here, update the import, okay? Property ID does not exist on type settings. That's right. Because we're using the user ID as our ID. Cool. So we don't need to pass that. Okay, now we need to make sure that the user form reflects the available fields. Let's update this incorrect settings form to make only, uh, to make the to provide the relevant fields based on the update mutation. So this is part 13 of a live coding series. So check out YouTube, Building Laterally, to see the full series. Name first, last, email, email backup, Stripe. This looks good. Um, here's the settings, setting form schema. I should reuse um, I should reuse this schema. Z string optional. So I'm going to rename this here. Okay, so I, I moved it basically. So we're gonna import it from the setting form now. Oh, now, and I immediately regret that. So we shouldn't have a mutation that imports a type from a query. Um, no, this is the right place to import it from. Sorry, let me delete this. That doesn't need to exist at all. Cool, now we have this like really lightweight setting form. Um, 
and the reference still works. Okay, so we're still getting our update settings schema from the mutation. In theory, I could split that into its own file or move it into a validators file or a types file. I think it's fine like this. The rule of one would say that it should go to its own file um, or possibly to a validators file. Cool, so let's npm run dev. See this work locally. I think I will not address the user checklist items bug in this stream. I'll deal with that later today. Romana, do you mind sharing your price on one-on-one -on -one coaching? No, not at all. I mean, it's on the website, right? So um, I think the base price is $80 currently. Book an expert session right here. Click it. Yep, and the base price is currently $80. Now remember, if you do the pay what you can, this is a crazy offer, y'all. If you do the pay what you can, as little as a dollar a month, most people are doing $5 a month. So thank you so much if you're doing five. I'm giving you a free session. Instead of $80, it could be $5. Um, so I definitely encourage you to take advantage of this. I'm currently planning on discontinuing it at the end of the month. All right, so now we're on localhost and I want to check my settings page now. That was super broken, what happened? Um, that was so broken, wasn't it? Let me preserve the log maybe. I'm gonna check preserve log on my UI console. Do you think adding AI to my project will make me stand out in the job market? Yes, I do. Okay, so this looks good. I think it might've just been like a build quirk, if that makes sense. This looks pretty good. I can go back to home. I can come back to settings, first name. So what are some of the, uh, okay, let's just make sure it works. Here's John, update setting, okay. So this is bad. Also the update setting button looks bad. Also the spacing is off. But these are all easily solved. So let me go to here. Um, suspense loading. I don't want it to say loading. I want it to be an empty container. And this setting form, we can add class name. And what is the tail end? Is it just P? Uh, P. I, I can do like P2. I want it down though. Okay, so here's the P2. Is it P top two? No. What is the tailwind style uh, class name for I would like do I want margin or do I want padding? I want margin. Um, margin above and below this container. I would like a small to moderate amount of margin. Um, probably one rim or less. Nice. Bro is doing math out here and they thought GPT-4 couldn't do math. 
Romana, I'm new to coding. How many hours do you think I need to master become a good developer? Uh, you don't need to master programming. So what's your question? It, are you actually interested in landing a job or do you want to master programming, which is much, much harder than landing a job? Uh, like me, I've been programming for 10 years and I don't know that I would claim to have mastered programming. Actually, I would definitely not have claimed to have mastered programming. Landing a job, right. That's what I thought. Uh, so if you would like to land a job, this is going to depend on your various personal factors, but let me just speak for the average person and then the personal consultation is about your particular factors. So book a consult with me if you'd like one-on-one. -on -one. But for the average person who is interested in programming, they can land a job in under a year. That is uh, more than 50% chance for the average person. Um, so it's not like 99% probability. It's like over 50%. It's like you can probably do it. Um, yeah, that would be my take. Romana says, I think I am above average person. Good, I hope so, but you wouldn't be the first one to think that who was wrong. <laughs> Without a degree, says Dot. Um, I think so. I think so. I would put it over 50%. Again, I wouldn't hit 90% or anything. Look, um, you can just go to a coding boot camp, for example, and that could take you four to nine months and they have job guarantees and they have placements, placement rates in excess of 80%. So um, now they do filter out people from getting into the coding bootcamp. So that's where things get sort of hard to say. And I really don't know. I really don't have the data on this, but I think um, most interested people who take the prep, is it prep, prep is here? Software, um, if you have data on this, please let me know. But I think most interested people who take this, I don't know, it might be less than 50%. I think that most people who take this are going to end up eligible for the bootcamp, but I'm really not sure about that, to be honest. So the Coursera, um, is a placement rate of 25%, but that's a bit of apples and oranges because that's placement into a job, not placement into a boot camp. I'll tell you with my own data that whenever I do one-on-one -on -one mentorships, it's, it's the same thing. I don't allow everyone to do the mentorship, but, but well north of 80-90% uh, of the people who do the mentorship have a successful outcome. How do I get myself out there in regards to getting a job? All about social networking, yo. Romana says, I'm doing the meta course right now for a front end developer. Perfect. That's a really good course. Great job. Keep in mind that even if you graduate, that only has a placement rate of about 25%, but that's still very good for a course. That might not sound good. I think there's a large knowledge gap on how ineffective online courses are in general. Okay. Um, this P2 should be my four. And the, um, good, I think that's a good amount of space between the please email John paragraph and the first name. This has MB4, so that will be four pixels, okay? This paragraph has no margin. So there is a bit of an excess gap, I think. I'm trying to figure out. No, no. Okay. It is four. So, so it's equivalent under the space under editing setting, edit setting, dude, I'm glitching it's under edit settings is equal to the space above first name. So I, I'm happy with that down here. The update settings button does not look good to me. I thought the update setting button would get some space basically, but it didn't. 
So instead of my, I'm going to do mt, which should just be the top if I'm not mistaken. Then we'll dive into the form and the submit button. Where's the update button? I'm not seeing the button. Is it in this form construct? Control Shift F, Control V, Enter, Update Setting. Here it is. Okay. So, Update Setting here. So, how do I change? the style of the form. It's right here. I want this to look more like the home page. Add M2 to the button. I, I probably will. I probably will. But I want to do more than that. I want it to look like um, I want it to look better. I don't want it to look like this. That's, I think, too loud. Um, I think a purple button would be good. Laterally light purple. Cool. I have a custom tailwind color called uh, laterally light purple. Here's the style for the form submit button. Update the button to have um, MT-2 margin and uh, the laterally light purple background color and white text. Yo, Ace. Hey, John. Been a lurker for a while. Came from TikTok originally. I'm starting an MSBA next month and contemplating using Twitch to document my journey. Any advice? I think that's a great idea. Uh, yeah, my only advice would be don't do it in a vacuum. So do it and don't do it in a vacuum. That would be my advice. So get with a social network. Maybe you're already involved. Um, I mean, obviously, there's my Laterally Discord. There's a bunch of other Discords, too. There's also the endorsed communities. I don't know if you've seen this. Um, like, I don't only recommend Laterally. I do record, and it's good to have a combination of large and small communities. The large ones get you more exposure. The smaller ones get you more tailored, kind of like deeper social connections, basically. Um, so yeah, document your journey and try to um, network with some other influencers. Maybe you can build yourself up a little audience. So this looks pretty good. I'm not seeing my button. Um, control C. What I want to check is whether my custom rule is text specific. So here's my Tailwind config. These other places are tending to use border laterally light purple. This says laterally light purple one. So maybe I need to add that.
Appreciate it. You got it. Thanks for being here. Oh, uh, it's not BG, right? It's background. Border. Yo, none of that is working. What's up? What's up? Is there something overriding it? Light purple M2 text white. We will just brute force it. So we'll do every combination try. So first we're doing background. Okay. Next I will try border. Border is not working over here either. So something is goofy here. Let me see one of these buttons that's currently using it. The reset password button, for example. Oh, look at that. It's impacting all of the buttons. <clears throat> I've seen you do some data projects. Have you ever been a data scientist in the past? That's my goal. No, I've not been a data economics, so I've done data science. I've done experiments involving data, experimental analysis, uh, advanced statistics, econometrics, that sort of thing. Like I'm a published researcher. Um, but I've never been employed as a data scientist, no. Okay, so this latterly style is straight up not working. Um, at some point there was a regression that I didn't catch. That's a mega bummer, dude. This is the login page. Let's go over there. Let's change the light purple to light purple dash one. So there could be some issue here. The issue is bigger than that. The issue is bigger than that. I'm going to stop the server and I'm going to do an npm run build. So this could be a build server. The dev server may not be able to access um, the Tailwind config at runtime. That could be the issue. You should download the live extension so that when you save, you don't have to refresh your browser. That'd be cool. I think it already does uh, hot reloading in a bunch of cases. Updates, ooh, what is that? Update setting schema is not exported. It 
It is the what? Update setting. Update settings schema. Source settings, source settings, mutations, update setting mutation. It totally is though. Let's ask chat Jippity. Why am I getting this error? Am I just like looking past the typo over and over? Oh yeah, it seems like it. Update settings. Yep, update settings mutation. Update settings mutation. Interesting that VS Code resolved it anyway, right? OK, let's try building this again. I think this is going to end up closing a different bug that I had that I wasn't prioritizing. But hey, a win is a win. Setting form build warning. Yep. So this will also close this. Let's try one more time. Update settings schema is not exported. Let's try one more time. What were the other reasons? It's not being exported at all from the update settings setting mutation file.
source settings mutations. I feel like I'm just missing a typo somewhere. Chili, corn, all right, thank you. What's up, Rock? Thanks. All right, I think we let it go for now. Source pages. Is there a list of pages in Blitz? Let me go to one of my other form. Update settings schema. So here's the checklist form. By the way, suspense is here and it's not used, so that's weird. So the checklist form is used where? It's used here with the create checklist schema from source checklist schemas. Maybe I should just move the folder. Maybe there's some sort of weird circular dependency thing going on. Create checklist schema. So let's just try that. Source checklist schemas. And what I would like to make is source settings schemas. Okay. Um, source checklist schemas. Schemas is a TS file, not a folder. Schemas.ts. Okay, so the rule of one wins again, doesn't it? Cut this, paste it here. Import Zod. Does the checklist schema have anything else? It only imports Zod. Otherwise, fine. Here, now import from schemas. This is the update settings mutation. And in the case of checklists, what about their mutation? It's just called update checklist, and it does import from schema. Update checklist. And the form is also imported here. So we are looking at the setting page for consistency. Okay. 
Now it is coming from schemas. Let's see if that fixed it. And if that didn't fix it, then we'll move on. We're hitting a time box. Romana, I'm learning data types and operators. Cool. Good for you. You got to learn uh, one thing at a time, right? So let's continue. We were here looking at the settings page. Oh, no, I wanted to deal with the style, and I thought that build was causing a style issue. Okay, so let's let the build resolve, then we will launch the dev server whether or not the settings bug is fixed. Cool, and it seems that that issue is gone. We still have this dynamic server fallback issue but the build warning on the settings not, in, not exported thing is gone. Okay, so I think it's a win. I think it's a win, right? Um, so let's, let's commit some of those things. Settings, I'm leaving this alone. I, I guess I need to check in all of these. The login is not necessary. Flex border. The login is not necessary. This is necessary. What about the form? No. What about the schemas? Yes. What about this form? I don't know. I don't know that this one matters because it's not using that mutation. So we'll skip that. Update settings mutation. This one definitely matters. Get settings. I don't think this one matters either. Well, it does because here we are updating the get settings, right? get settings. Yep. So let's go ahead and do that. So this feature is show settings and fix um, mutation typo. Cool. All right, so now we are continuing and we are focusing on currently the login page and then the settings form momentarily. So currently we're here on the login page. We're going to npm run dev. Now that the build is working better and we've done an npm run build on this machine recently, maybe that will somehow provide TypeScript things to the dev server. And if not, we'll chat with Jeopardy. I think we're in the last 30 minutes of the stream here, y'all, on the home stretch. Thanks for being here. If you're enjoying the video, make sure to tap like, follow the page, Hit the notification bells so you can see when I go live in the future. You can come join the Discord and chat after we're done. We'd love to see you. And share the video with an interested friend. I'm in particular trying to grow my YouTube audience right now. So consider subscribing on YouTube. Okay, it exists out here. Empty cache and hard reload. So the button is persistently not being shown, right? If I drop the text white, then I will be able to see the text. Um, this is the login button, right? So the particular issue really is this border laterally light purple. Let me look on the styles over here. Border laterally light purple is defined with 
Why is that being provided? Okay, let's check out control, uh, control P, tailwind config. I'm looking for this rule, border opacity, opacity, and I'm not seeing it. Control P, login TSX. Here's the laterally login TSX. So I see, um, oh, the back to home button is also doing a thing. Yeah. <laughs> back to home. is wrapped in a light purple. It's just gone. Text laterally teal. Is that working? Is this teal? Text laterally teal and then it is a purple color. Wow. That's not good. Yeah, if I just unch... Oh, okay. It's the opacity. Okay, so the border is working there. Off, on. Off, on. Without opacity, with opacity. So it's working there. It's not working within this form context. Um... And I don't see that teal text is working either. But I think the teal text is not working because it's being overridden over here. Teal color. I think teal is just purple. Okay, so let's go check Tailwind config. I think teal is just in the system as purple. Okay, here's laterally teal, allegedly. Um, and what color is this? I think this is a malformed hex code. Is my whole theme based on a malformed hex code? Wow. What if I delete the F? Uh, it's still a purple. Also, I don't like the look of teal there. I need to go back in my prior stream when I did the uh, When I define teal, <laughs> let's look it up. Um, can I also look in my GitHub master branch way back in the way back in the commits? Let's see anything about theme, color, tailwind, none of the above. Okay. Oh, there's t I did see the TWES lint color, theme. TW tail. Let's look in this TWES lint commit. Okay, install linters. Integrate Stripe, Subscription, Favicon, Tips. Style Settings page. Surely there's some teal being dropped in here, right? 
Okay, so here we can see on the left, toast container on the right, teal. Um, so let's go to this revision of the code. We're browsing files at this revision. What am I looking for? I'm looking for the tailwind config, the word teal. Okay, and it's purple here as well. <laughs> Has it just always been purple? Um, yeah, maybe it was just always purple. So this is commit 27. You can only go back so far, you know? So we might as well just keep going. Brand new Blitz app. Migrate PG. Style checklist page. I think this is the first style commit. So we'll browse at this revision. This is commit number 18. Do I have a tailwind config? I still have a tailwind config here. Teal is still purple. What about use Postgres? Do I have Tailwind config when I'm using Postgres? Yep. What about the initial commit? Nope, so I don't have a tailwind on the initial commit. Kind of seems like I do though, because I'm talking about it in the docs. Yep, here it is. Okay, so it's always been purple, basically. So I think I want to just drop it from the theme. Because apparently I've never used teal. Uh, and I don't know what the reference value would be at this point. And also, using it right here, it looks kind of goofy. So I'm going to go with delete. That's my solution to the teal issue, if you will. Okay, um, I think these should be laterally purple. I need to compare these basically. 6-2-A-F, is that a hex transform of this color? color this, bam. No, that is decidedly lighter. Decidedly lighter. What about this dark purple? 6-2-A-F. Are you secretly 6-2-A-F? Whoa, nope. You are a really dark purple. Although you might be the right one um, for text. Six two AF. The RGB form is this thing one oh two. Do I have a 102 anywhere in here? Nowhere. 
Okay, so laterally teal is a different shade of purple. Um, so let me try to place it in terms of darkness. It is lighter than the dark purples. Uh, it's darker than that. That's a little darker. These are all pretty light. Oh, well, they're called laterally light purple. Okay, I feel like an idiot now. Um, okay, so maybe it's violet instead of purple. Here's violet 500. It goes 1, 2, 3, 500, 600. So maybe it's like a, a 4, basically. Okay, we're on to something. That looks a little darker if you ask me. So that lightened it a little. Darker, lighter, darker. Okay. And what about versus the 600? It's also lighter. So this is like a, uh, a 700, I think. I don't know if that's allowed. But I think this is like um, laterally violet 700 is what I would call this. So let me change it over to the RGBA for consistency. Or the RGB, I guess. Okay, so here's the RGB. Also, looking at it, it doesn't look darker. Um, from the RGB. Oh yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Because lower numbers are darker, right? So this is these are lower numbers, so it's darker. That does make sense. And then laterally teal, we will replace with laterally violet 700. Okay, so control shift H will be replaced in all files. You want to be careful with this bad boy. So I don't just smash the button. I look through them sort of one by one. Okay, that looks pretty good. So now I should have no laterally teal. We can basically go ahead and stage this, getting rid of laterally teal. We should probably dry out this component. It's the same back to home component every time. Okay, so all of these except this form right here, basically. 
So let's uncheck the form. And this is style rm laterally teal. All right, so, and it says that the revision changed. I don't know why it's doing that. I think the Vite compiler is doing some sort of like a Linux-based change. And it's cramping my style, to be honest with you. Okay, so, and now let me refresh the page. So that didn't hot reload, did it? This is the new improved Violet, yeah, so we got the 100 number, so this is the Violet 700. The new improved Violet 700. Boom. Slaps this bad boy. Okay, so these look good. I look fly. I look good. I'm not authenticated anymore. That's right. So let's go to the sign up page. And the button is invisible. Okay. Hey, at least it's consistent. So ladder... Laterally light purple one. It has to be the button base background, right? Because why would I have white text on a white background? So it has to be the button base background um, has changed. So this is an anchor tag and that's why that's different. This is a button. Cool, I think I got it. I think the button base background has changed. I don't know why the, so there's two problems here. The first problem is that the button base background has changed. And the second problem is that the border is just not showing up at all. Um, here on computed, it says that it computes, can I just do like border black? It says that it's computing a border, but I don't see it. Um, maybe because it is zero pixels in width. Um, border width. Okay. So it has a border color, but it's zero pixels in width. That's the issue. And so over here on this one, um, we have the color, but in addition, how are we getting a border width? Border bottom width, one pixel. Where's that coming from? From dot border. Literally, this is the mamma jamma that's missing. Ah, uh, R. Yep, and if I do that, the border goes away. Okay, so here, did I say mamma jamma? Y'all can fire me because I said mamma jamma. Okay, so here, now I have my border. Good. And I want to give it some rounding. Border, da, 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 da. I want to give it some rounding. Border radius, style. So this is coming from the solid keyword, or does it say solid? I don't know. Border left style solid is coming from the solid keyword. Where does it say solid? I'm not seeing it. I think that's just a border default. So this does not claim to have any border radius then, is that right? It looks like it has border radius to my eyes, but maybe I'm just hallucinating. Border radius. All right, let's let it go. Um, this guy has some radius. Where's your radius coming from? Border.
I'm not seeing it. Is it the border box thing? Maybe it's the border box and then a higher order container has some radius on it. Yo, legit, where's the radius coming from? Um, this doesn't have a class on it at all. Here, what if I get rid of this? Bam. Nope, that didn't do it. Bam. Nope, that didn't do it. Um, yeah, it seems like it was this one. Well, that's a really helpful class name, isn't it? So let's go find where this guy is styled. Here's the login form. Okay, name, password. So it is styled via labeled text field, is that right? Styled via labeled text field. Here's the labeled text field. Oh, is the idea that inputs in general are just styled this way now? So here's some border radius. It's right there. Um, it's like silently attached to the input without using a class. OK, whatever. This is some library is doing this. I don't know which one, though. That's pretty whack. <laughs> oh, OK. It's coming from here. Radius. Yeah, OK. So it's just coming in this style tag right here. Uh, hmm. That feels bad. So what to do in this case? Border one picks solid purple. I think that's influencing, yeah, that's influencing this, for example, is one pick solid purple. Hmm, it's not getting the theme at all, is it? This sort of component here. No, it just needs a border class. And then it needs some additional border radius. OK, so this top one doesn't have border radius. It just kind of looks like it to my eye, but I'm sort of like, I guess, hallucinating it. Or it's coming from the nav. I don't think so. Um, and it's just unlike it's just unlike these, which have manually added border radius. So here I could style it manually. Right? And that's how I want it to look. So how do I accomplish this with Tailwind? Um, How can I accomplish three border radius with Tailwind? Is it BR? So we can do two or four.
rounded SM, rounded MD. Here, let me disable this three picks. Bam, now you have sharp corners. Rounded MD should be noticeable. It doesn't work at all because I need to do that ahead of time. All right, cool. So here we are, we're on the login form. We're crying, woe is me, why is this not working? This is the login button, login, login, login. So this is the wrong button, control F, login. Okay, uh, oh, that's the uh, H1. Where's the button? Email, password. Oh, it's the same generic form component, isn't it? So it's just using this login text, submit text. Okay, so it's the same old, it's the same old daddy. It's the same old daddy, if you will. So over here, this is where we need to say border. Right, and now we have fixed the, uh, the border not showing up. But now I want to do border radius, so I will say rounded, S, uh, rounded MD. or see if we can play invalid order, that's fine. It will shuffle them around. That looks too much. So what if we try the rounded SM? I think it's fine. What do these guys have? Rounded LG. So these are very, very round. Um, let's check the MD one more time. It looks good either way. All right, we'll go with rounded MD because it will be more coherent because it is closer to the rest of the site. Okay, so a couple issues remaining. One, I need to throw the background color in there. That's easy enough. What color do I want to use? I would like to use background, um, whatever I want, BG. Let's make it darker since the text is white. Um, uh, let me look at my tailwind. Dark purple one, how about that? Um, does dark purple to lighten it or darken it further? I think these dark purples are meant to be for font. What? Background, okay, it needs to be done ahead of time. Dark purple two. Still seems really dark. Uh, let's do a standard violet. Let's do that 700 that we're so crazy about. Uh, we're using it for the text on the other case anyway, so this is sort of like inversion of that, which is good from a design point of view. Background laterally violet 700. Where's my intelligence homie? Okay, I like this color. I like this color. I need some padding. Um, P4. Making me do everything ahead of time. That's okay. P4. That's way too much. Um, P2. Still looks goofy, doesn't it? Why does it look weird? Why does it look so weird, bro? Huh. I don't really know. Uh... Okay, that looks good. Yeah, turn up. PX4. Everyone wants to get a PX4, don't they? PX4. So this is looking dandy. It's slightly out of alignment because this is a four pixel border radius. These are three pixel border radius. Let's go change that up. 
can't tolerate that nonsense. Looking for border radii. Three pixels. Of course, it's the only three pixel in the whole app, and the other are, um, what is 0 0.75? That's so weird. That's super weird. Let's just make this one. No, let's not. I don't know what that's referring to. I would feel more consistent if they were all like on four scale or even number, but for another day. Good, so it's looking more consistent now. Um, this is like wonky because it's like over here. Like, why are you over there, dude? Um, that makes more sense, right? Cool, this makes more sense, forgot your password. Got your password. Never mind. That's a totally different component. Okay. Yeah, and this already looks good. Okay, we're looking better. So now I have a login page where I can see the button. Were y'all really logging in without being able to see the button? I'm so sorry, y'all. Here's a sign up page. You can actually see the create account button. Back to home, log in. This is me. Uh, cool, and now when I go to the settings page, which is what we're really working on, this looks pretty good. Um, I want it to have an M2 top. It already does have an M2 top. What do I make it an M4? Is that, it looks better here, but now is it gonna be goofy on all the other pages? Okay, let's go check. Close others. Let's do the M4. Great looking settings page. We love to see it. Now if I log out and I log in, it's, um, oh, you know what? Because I put an M2 bottom on the forgot your password. So if I remove that, we'll be good. Um, MB2 not needed. Back home, sign up page. This already looks fine. Log in. Cool. All right, and we have achieved style nirvana. Don't you love some CSS work? So here we will stage these as a style fix. Um, really, it's a really it's a fix. Um, style fix better form submit button. Okay. The only remaining issue is uh, that these fields are currently like acting like they're required when, when they're not. Invalid email. <coughs> Excuse me. So I should be able to send an empty string for this field.
It's optional. It's optional, right? So why is it why is it being considered invalid? Am I even hitting the network tab? I don't even think it's even sending. Expected stream received null. Expected stream received null. Okay, so the issue is that when I empty the field, um, some logic somewhere is turning it null when I expect it to be an empty stream. I think the form itself is doing that. is final form. Um, I'm trying to submit the settings form and the UI with an empty string or backup email, but I am told that I should not be sending a null value. Um, why does the system believe there is a null value? Does Blitz or React Final Form or Zod or something else, AutoCourse, my empty field into a null. When you're working with HTML, an empty field will send an empty string, not a null value. However, some libraries might interpret as null or undefined. In the case of Zod and React Final Form, if a field is optional in Zod, it accepts undefined, but not null. If you allow null, oh, okay. Um, it might be coming in as null from the database. Let me check. <laughs> database says empty for me. Doesn't say null. Without seeing the exact error message or code that's throwing the error, it's hard to determine the exact cause. However, it's likely the issue is coming from the server-side validation, possibly in your Zod schema or your Prisma model, rather than the form submission. Why are the network... what? Why are the network requests not coming in? Okay. What, why did it just delete everything? I only want one field. Expected a string received no. Okay, so here's your string. Invalid email. 
Okay, so it's complaining about invalid email. That, by the way, it's not, so GPT thinks it's on the server side, it's not, because we're not making a network request. So here's the schema, it's an invalid email. So yeah, so the issue is that it's doing email validation before it allows optional. So let's see if I can just do that. Okay. Um, the issue is occurring client side on invalid email. This is because email validation is performed before optional allowance. And then I hit the period in the comma because I'm dumb. I see that the issue is that Zod is trying to validate an empty string as an email before checking that it's optional. So here's how this like the super complicated way that you can can do that. Okay, um, extract the refine statement to make it reusable. That didn't really save much time, did it? Um, okay, never mind. I'll just take it this way. Here's the email backup. Here's the email stripe. Okay. I was basically wanting to to make this reusable. Yeah, I can. I can. So this is uh, optional email. So here is export const optional email type. And that sh that's not actually a type, that's an optional email schema validator. It's an optional email validator. What's up? Good job. Definitely. What's up? Whoa, that's a great, um, that's a great day. High five. Do you want to have a sip of the drink? Sure. Let's see if my program works. Nope, it doesn't. So why does it receive null now? Ellie. Hey, 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 bring that back. Bring that back. One sip. A stadium? Yeah, like a monster jam stadium with dragon. So I think that kind of works. Oh, nice clip. And now it's persisting my first name. Alright, let's get out. Ooh, I play drums. Uh, it's not the time for drums. Guys, get out. No, get out. You said hi, Daddy. Let's go upstairs. Cool. So it's persisting my Bye. first name now. See ya. See you soon. Poppy Sensei, what up? What up? So it's persisting my name now. Um, but it did it in a weird way, right? Like, why is it popping up in red underneath? Why is it doing that? I don't see any error. Now the submission is working and the data is stored in the database, but I notice a strange behavior. After 
I save my name in the form, the UI displays my name in red text as if there were some issue, although the submission goes fine. Um, I can debug it, but before I do that, return form error to string. Based on the below component code, do you have any idea what might be causing the behavior of the strange red text. I'm not seeing any error and I'm getting 200s. Ah, well, if it's undefined, that could be causing the issue. Let's alter this statement so that null and undefined values are always cast into an empty string. Does it remember the settings type is going to be the question. It may be outside of the context window. It may have forgotten by now. Oh, it still loops over the values. Yeah, that'll work. I would rather be more explicit, but this is fine. When is the schema applied? It says name first string or undefined. Why is it allowing undefined? So is the schema, because it's optional. So the schema is applied before getting here, right? And here's this, and this is schema is consistent. Uh, 
Ah, okay. Yeah, so the problem is in the schema itself, right? So here, we shouldn't make it optional. Is optional casting things to null? Um, it's not optional. It's not optional. It's allowed to be empty. It's allowed to be, and okay, that's on me. I just wasn't thinking. So these are not optional, actually. Um, email cannot be empty. What if I do this? Natty boy, good evening, Mr. John. What up, Natty boy? Well, I still got the phantom red. Expected string received null. There's some sort of like a final form logic that is when you empty it out, it's changing it to null. So, man, I thought that I was going to simplify things by supporting a string only pattern because the DOM supports string only. So I piped it through all the way to the P all, all the way to Postgres. But now I'm fighting my form library. That's no fun. When I type my name and then clear the field, I receive expected string received null. So some library is coercing the value to null. All right, so basically allow the Zod schema to allow null. So the DOM will never pass null. All right. Well, the DOM will never pass null, so we're just accommodating a uh, goofy library feature now. Will this... Um, I think this will fix the backspacing issue, but I don't know if it'll fix the phantom red issue. So here I say foo, tab over, delete it. All right, so the... the um, Unexpected null is gone now. What about the phantom? Right, uh, must not be null, please use undefined instead. I would think that I can always cast it to an empty string.
So what I want to do is, I guess I'll spell it out. Email backup Stripe name first name last. So here is name first name last. So now the type's happy, I need to make sure that we do the right thing. Thanks for the likes, Kids Tech. Thanks for being here. Okay, so that resolved that issue, and we still got the Phantom Red. I um, I might have to let the Phantom Red live. Let me just, um, oh yeah, is something logging to the console? Nothing is logging to the console. It's not like it, it's not like the system even thinks that there's an error. So let me comment that. Does this remove the phantom red? No. Um, What is this, man? Roll alert. Here's my new validator. Here's my new component code. I do not I no longer receive this error I still have an error of red text the alert component being rendered on successful form submission. Oh, I hit my limit. We'll try GPT-3, but I think this means it's time to wrap up the stream.
Currently, the code inside the catch block is commented out, which prevents any error from being returned. I think this is just wrong. <laughs> um, okay, let's stage these and then I will try doing this, but I don't think that this is right. Where does set submitting come from? Okay, it doesn't know that I'm using final form. Are you expecting that I use React? Return form error, error to string. Yeah, this is why I don't use 3.5. It's I think it's just wrong. And it's just so frequently and boldly wrong. So it was telling me that I should return form error colon error to string. That's what I was doing previously. Why would returning the error quiet the red text? I'm so confused. Um, what if I just do this? Is the issue that there's like nothing there at all? I think this is just, I think 3.5 is just completely wrong. Banana. What is it returning it to? So this sort of return is considered good. I guess a truthy return is considered good. Okay, let's go ahead and debug it. Two is not in the catch at this point. So we can re-enable that. Um, I think the issue is with one of these two lines, 35 or 36. Cool. So we, we, we hit the, we hit the debugger. And what does updated say? By the way, why are the admin, admin notes being propagated to the UI? I did not want to select admin notes when I use current user.
So here is setting. There's nothing wrong with this so far. Although there is this weird circularity where it's like the user with the subscription with the user, but whatever. Okay, we get down here and the red text is not shown yet. Here's updated. And we invalidate and so it grabs it at this time. Okay, so it is grabbing a new one before the update is completed maybe. So is that causing an issue? I don't know why it would because these are still valid form fields. Still looking good. So what is the issue? What? Bro, it, it didn't. Um, okay, what if, what if I don't invalidate the query? and it still does it. Okay, now finally it does not. So is there something strange in this return statement? Let's go see, here we are in the settings list. Let me see, update checklist. Um, I wanna see, I wanna look at the page, edit. I wanna see the form, here's the form, and it doesn't return anything. So is the idea that if you return anything, that's error, Bill? I think that's the idea. Yeah, like if you return anything, that's errorville. Okay. So let's try this. In theory, this does not cause the issue. Robot boy. Um, let's go ahead and re-enable that we invalidate the query. I don't even need to extract updated. So what happens to updated? Set query data. Hmm, we're using the query differently. Yeah, that could be the issue. Okay, so we don't want to call the database again. We want to sort of use this caching, caching mechanism. Setting. Set query data. So we await the update and then we await setting the data. So we await the update and then we await setting the data this way. Um, that's super illegal when I say as any like that. That's like super, super illegal. But this is for testing only. Famous last words. Robot boy. I got a 200. And I have no phantom red text. 
Yay. Okay, so let's get rid of this stuff. Um, and I think now I just need to fix the type. So here updated is a proper checklist. So here updated needs to be a proper setting. Setting is a settings type. By the way, let's call it settings with an S. Okay, and here we'll say updating updated as settings. Update settings. This needs to be type aware. Okay, so get settings has this type. Now we need to export settings. Export settings, and we can call this like laterally settings. We can call this export type. Uh, we can call this user settings. Kind of like that more. User settings. Okay. Because it was trying to import it from HTTP2 request library, and it's like this is not that kind of thing. Are we also supposed to use Blitz.js RPC resolver? Um, use query the checklist edit checklist edit page use query use mutation. Okay, cool. So those are the right ones. Z shift Z here. Let's do user settings. So this is better than any typing it. Um, but the system is complaining like your type, your type is wrong is what the system is saying. Okay, so this is just a straight up user. Um, yeah, so the system is right. So the interesting thing is that the only portion of the settings object which is updatable is the user sub object. So we need to merge it back in. So I can so actually the system is right. I should not be doing this. It worked for testing purposes. But what I want to do is um, merge it back in. So here's the updated user. Now I want the updated settings. Um, which is going to, I, I can just destructure, I think. How do you feel about that? It's letting the tap, it's letting the pass type through. I can be more explicit this way, so let's do it. Yeah. I think we're in show business. Okay, um, robot boy, let's uh, refresh the page. Here's my real name, if you were curious. It is John Vandevere. Cool. Um, the funny thing is now I'm wanting some kind of visual confirmation that the update completed. So I'll just do a janky alert message. How about that? Update succeeded. Uh, and then if I refresh the page, update succeeded. Okay, I think it works for now. It works for now. 
So that's going to be it for today. Thanks for tuning in. Um, here And what do we call this? This is... Like user can user can update settings, update settings with no um, phantom red text or other weird submission artifacts. It's kind of a fix commit rather than a feature commit, but whatever. I'm not going to splice hairs. And that does it for today's stream. So as soon as this build passes, I'll push it up to prod and you can use it later. Thanks for being here.